I finished watering my plants and moved on to the task of untangling dead grapevines from my fence when the phone call came. It was the news that another guy from my unit died by suicide. Suicide stalks my friends and I like a camouflaged enemy, and this year marked the seventh such call since my time in the wars. It's a silent killer that I cannot evade, attack, or save others from, even though I'm a trained Green Beret medic. I noticed my pain two months after I came home. After 20 years of service, with 11 deployments and five and a half years in combat, I started to crack. I slept for only two hours a night, and I cried in the shower before work. I trafficked in unaddressed childhood trauma for years. I have my alcoholic mother to thank for that, a woman who exemplifies such trauma even more than I do, which is impressive. She's never been in a war zone. But she experienced decades of trauma and made sure I got a heaping dose of it too. The past depressed me. The future made me anxious. And I was terrified that others would see me as shamefully as I saw myself. Trauma bifurcated me, like a tree sprouting another branch. I was left with mean and spiteful voices in my head that I couldn't control. I did the best I could, I would tell myself in the mirror. The critics shouted back at me, you moved too fucking slowly and he died, you piece of shit. And that moment, one of several such moments the voices reminded me of, came rushing back to me. The pre-dawn ambush when my friend Aaron died. We had just finished the mission en route to the helicopters when a machine gun opened up. I froze in my tracks at the long burst of rat-a-tat-tat gunfire. Aaron was hit five times in the navel. His plates couldn't save him. And when I saw his wounds, I knew nothing could. I was in that dirt street in the darkness with no way to bring him home. My mates watched as I sealed his holes in his body with dressings, praying to keep him alive until the helos came. There in that dirt and the dark, I held him in my lap, watching his eyes fade into lifeless pools of blue-green as I waited for the sound of rotor blades. The negative voices brought this and other scenes into my mind at every available opportunity, interrupting every calm moment. They dashed any bit of joy or hope I had. And even with hours of therapy and truckloads of medication, I entertained thoughts of my own death. The first line antidepressants the shrink gave me only increased my suicidality. I made two failed attempts, which sent me on a nightmarish 18-month inpatient journey through the military mental health apparatus. I cried so hard my nose bled my whole identity was shattered. I had panic attacks at night where the orderlies lovingly gave me drugs to calm me down. I tried everything the doctor suggested. There are some experimental procedures we'd like to get your thoughts on, they said. We're going to look at low-level shocks to the brain and some different ways to alter its natural frequency. Happy to help. <laughs> How about dolphin therapy? Absolutely. Always wanted to work at SeaWorld. <laughs> as I probably could have guessed, the dolphin therapy was as useless as the electric shocks. At 7 a.m. every Sunday, I went with a small group to Point Loma. They taught me hand signals, and I sent the dolphins off to do tricks. Then they came back, squeaking and smiling, and I gave them a mackerel as their treat. The idea was to do something enjoyable, way different from what I was used to. But feeling cold, wet, and slimy, I returned to the barren Cinderblock Hospital for the next seven days, too depressed to have actually enjoyed it. I hated me. God hated me. Dolphins only tolerated me for fish treats. <laughs> I continued other therapies, group, individual, CBT, CPT, EMDR, DBT, you name the psychiatric acronym, I did them all. And of course, pills more pills. They made me feel dissociated from everything, my body, my family, my job, and they didn't do a damn thing to quiet the voices in my head. I decided to kick them when I switched therapists. 
It took years and tons of therapy before I no longer felt suicidal, but true happiness seemed like a far off goal. I was married by then. I had a kiddo, a house, a job. I checked all the boxes just like the therapist told me to do. I guessed that I was normal, healthy, and okay, just like they said I would be. But even in my happiest moments, shame and guilt still plagued me. I tried to get out of my head and focus on my wife and son. I was pushing my son on the swing set at the park when an older memory hit me. This was more foundational. I remembered myself at six or seven years old, sitting on a swing set in the backyard with the taste of fresh blood in my mouth. My face was hot, my ears were ringing, my lip swollen. My mother had gone into another drunken rage and I was her personal whipping boy. I summoned my therapy techniques, tried to pull myself out of, and back to the present and my son. Heart racing from delving into the past, I noted how scared I was. I scanned the playground for threats, predators, guns, bombs, Taliban. I, then I realized I was in a goddamn park in San Diego. I breathed deeply and slowly through my nose. My pulse slowed. I pushed my son. Where was that fucking therapy dolphin when I needed him? <laughs> but the hard-fought peace lasted only a few minutes before the critics piped up again. Remember when Aaron died? You could have saved him, they sneered. The voices assaulted me, trying to convince me that his wounds were survivable. His death was all on me. Finally, they brought all the dead back to life in my mind, all my dead friends, challenging me to change the past. Without a solid idea of what to try next, I got a LinkedIn suggestion to, out of the blue to connect with Dirty, a guy I served with, with whom I hadn't seen in 15 years. Dirty and I never actually worked together, but in a small company of knuckle draggers, we knew each other's reputation. He was a giant six foot four Mexican dude with a keen intellect and a calm demeanor that belied his ability to get aggressive when necessary. We got to talking, then agreed to meet up for lunch. Working on his third taco, he asked if I knew anything about psychedelics. What, like mushrooms, I asked? My only experience was a mindgasm of a fish concert on LSD in my 20s. <laughs> Something like that, he said. There's this organization down in Mexico working with Ibogaine. It's part of a study run by Stanford. I'm going to do it. You want in? Just like every ultimately fruitless opportunity in the past, I jumped at the idea. But this one felt different. Six weeks later, all my fingernails excitedly chewed down to bloody nubs, I flew up to Stanford to start the study. I felt I had been waiting for this experience for decades. There were four guys in my cohort, two SEALs, a Team Six dude, and a fellow Green Beret who spent years blowing open walls or dropping entire buildings as necessary. We were five guys with decades of combat experience formerly the tip of the spear during the wars, and now look at us, reduced to meek, timid travelers, hoping that some ancient, secretive African plant could take away the pain of our past. The Stanford folks sent us to Tijuana because, inexplicably, this is illegal in the US. <laughs> we crossed the border and headed to a house in Playas Rosarito. Three stories of modern Mexican architecture, thoughtfully dressed in warm earth tone paints and overlooking the ocean. It was like I could feel all the suffering that had passed through the structure from other travelers like me. I felt small as I trudged along the cold tile floors, dragging my pain like an overnight bag. This place would be my final battleground. We got started with a traditional sweat lodge to get in the right mindset. We needed to open our minds to the idea of spiritual healing with medicines and techniques not found in your average Kaiser Permanente. <laughs> Finally, we got to the medicine. Ibogaine is a potent psychedelic that only grows in Gabon, Africa, where it has been used for a couple thousand years. I was supposed to take four pills 30 minutes apart. Already feeling the effects of the first pill, I took the second. I saw myself in the mirror yet couldn't recognize who I was. My eyes glistened with excitement and my form began to blur in, from solid lines into an energetic haze. 
I pulled down my eye mask, laid back on the thick floor mattress, and went for a 19-hour active trip. The nausea hit me early, and I tried to concentrate on the speakers in the room playing traditional African drums, rattles, and flutes. I settled into the darkness and sensed that I was flanked by spirit guides. They spoke without speaking, conveying to me all the therapies I had been through. My tears flowed as I was separated from my traumas and my previous life. There were no dirt roads with dying friends, no swing sets that reminded me of the taste of blood. I started to retch, dry heaving small blobs of thick, noxious bile, then collapsed onto my mattress. In the darkness, white lines created geometric shapes while voices mumbled beyond my perception. Even though I was unable to move my body, I realized I was free. I was terrified, but I welcomed the fear. I cried out internally with a triumphant war cry. I pictured myself at age 16, teaching judo to nine-year-olds. The blue plastic mats squeaked under the movement as I play wrestled with them between classes. I was in the best space possible. My mother had given up on me, and I was free to spend as much time on the mats as I wanted. These kids looking up to me as their role model, me of all people. I was trusted, honored, and accomplished for the first time in my life. The mats offered me space to be my own person and enjoy the growth. I realized family isn't always blood. I belonged. It was my definition of love. As I lay there, I experienced a peace and calm I hadn't felt in decades. The voices, long-standing cursed companions, disappeared. I reveled in the spaciousness of mental silence, feeling like I'd just done decades of therapy in 19 hours. I saw the generational cycle I was part of. I saw that I hurt people out of my own hurt. I saw the Sisyphean task of letting go of my shame to break that cycle. Somehow, the Ibogaine pruned all the traumatic branches that had grown from me. I was whole and singular and 100% me. No one ever heard the negativity in my head, and so it's not surprising to me that no one sees much difference in me. But I feel different. My internal world is quieter, and the critics have stopped shouting, all because of a ma magical African plant that in a way became the roots of the garden I tend every day. The broken branches of my past are now the mulch that helps feed my family. My potato harvest is looking especially promising this year. <laughs> there are no voices in my head other than my own and no lurking bad guys in the garden, save for the occasional mole rat. After that phone call with the news that another man from my unit had taken his own life, I knew that no one would ever get that call on my behalf. I wish that he and so many people I've known could have had this opportunity. I hung up the phone and returned to clearing grapevines from my fence. I had to make room for new ones.